Well, let me officially welcome everyone to the evening session of Force Connect's webinar series. Webinars is one of the uh, program activities of Forest Connect. We've been running this now since May of 2007, so we're well over 10 years, and I've been, um, I, I've, it's been to my great benefit to have great presenters like Christy Sullivan, who has uh, participated uh, at least once a year, I think, every year. So I'd, I'd have to go back and double check. But Christy's been a very frequent presenter and is consistently a great presenter. So whenever I have a chance to get Christy on, it's um, it makes it easy for me and great for you all. So Christy's going to speak with us tonight about the issue of deer impacts on woodland vegetation. And with that, I'm just going to mute my microphone and turn it over to Christy. Welcome, Christy. Okay, thanks, Pete. That was very kind of you. And uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me on this snowy winter evening. Um, I'm going to be talking about our deer eating your woods tonight. And we thought March might be a good time to do that. Um, tell you about a, a volunteer deer uh, vegetation monitoring protocol that we've developed in preparation for the, the soon to be spring field season, but it's not looking very spring like out there right now. Um, but hopefully that will uh, will be changing in just a few weeks. So I'm going to start out um, by talking about the condition of New York's forests overall, and really um, it applies to our forests across the Northeast. I'm going to talk about how deer affect our woodlands and how they're impacting um, what the condition of our woodlands. And then I'm going to talk about AVID, which is a um, stands for Assessing Vegetation Impacts from Deer, and tell you how you can get involved um, in this um, vegetation assessment protocol. So what makes a healthy forest? Well, there are many different things that contribute to uh, making a healthy forest, but two very important components are that under the um, right conditions, a variety of native plant and tree species will be able to grow, so not just a monoculture of a few species, but a nice diversity, and that there's the ability for a new forest to grow or what's called regenerate in the case of disturbance, and that can be either a natural disturbance like a, a blowdown or an ice storm or um, an intentional disturbance uh, such as what would happen when you plan and, and execute a timber harvest. So in 2010, the Nature Conservancy uh, released a report. They did some modeling to predict um, the potential of our forest tree canopies to regenerate, or our forest species that we find in our tree canopies to regenerate across the state. So looking at this map, I just want to point out that anything that's dark green or light green is either very good or good opportunity for a forest to regenerate in the case of a disturbance or uh, fair is in orange and poor is in red. So you can see in this slide when you think about all the different native species we have or any native species, um, we have about six across the state, 68% have a good to very good chance of regenerating. And about a third are poor to fair in terms of the ability to regenerate a forest. And most of the Hudson Valley and the Catskills are where things look, uh, look the worst on this map. So that's Again, that's any uh, native species, so that would include American beech. When they looked at just species that are valuable for timber species, so things like maple and oak and maybe ash, then the situation looked a little more bleak. Only 43% of our forests would be good to very good, and over half would be poor to fair. And you can see there that a lot more areas, including a lot of the Adirondacks, um, start to look uh, not so good in terms of the ability to regenerate. And that's in large part because before American Beach was included, and uh, in this slide it's removed. So it's not also just not the, um, the, the uh, economic impacts of losing those timber species, but it's also really kind of a proxy for having diversity in your forest, being having the ability to have a, a a variety of different kinds of trees in your forests, nice uh, stable communities. And um, also those species like oak, uh, for example, tend to be good wildlife food producing 
uh, species too. So it has um, implications for, for wildlife diversity as well. Um, in 2009, um, some of my colleagues conducted a survey of foresters and they asked um, of the stands that they regularly visited or had visited recently, uh, what percent of them uh, were either hi having highly successful regeneration, moderately successful, marginally successful, or were a complete failure. And across the state, statewide, so this column right here, um, 45% said uh, of the stands were only uh, marginally successful regeneration that was happening. 25 were a complete failure, um, and uh, about 30 altogether were either moderately successful or highly successful. So two thirds, basically, of the forest stands were reported to not be doing very well. When they were asked what they thought uh, the reasons were, the the for the um, forest not uh, regenerating. The highest uh, number said that deer browsing was an issue, and second to that was interfering vegetation. So most foresters identifying, identified deer browsing as a significant issue to getting good regeneration on the ground. So deer are, are an interesting species. A lot of people refer to them as a keystone species because they really have the ability um, through what they eat and how much they eat to change um, not only uh, their own habitat, but also the habitat of other wildlife species. So how do they um, affect the forest? Uh, there are a number of ways. The first way is that they change the forest structure. So in this slide, you can see there's a, an open forest, a kind of a park-like stand, not much vegetation um, on the forest floor or not much of a shrub layer or an understory or mid-story layer. You basically just have the tree canopy there. And although it's a pretty dense stand, not a lot of sunlight getting through, there is some. So you would expect to have some patches of something growing on the ground. But in this slide, those layers of vegetation are completely absent. This picture shows a forest stand that was harvested. The, it was one stand. It was harvested in the same way on the left-hand side of the slide and the right-hand side of the slide. The only difference is that deer, you can see the fence running through the middle, deer were excluded or kept out of the area on the right-hand side of the slide. And you can see the big difference that made after several years. So on the right-hand side, you see that there are, there's other vegetation, other tree seedlings, growing up a variety of different species in there you can see in the front in the foreground and you have you're starting to get those additional layers of vegetation on the left hand side if you look at about the five to six foot level of height of the trees you can see that there's basically nothing in the level uh, where deer can reach so up to five or six feet high and that's called a browse line and the other thing you see is that there's a, a complete monoculture or stand of ferns that has kind of taken over. Deer tend not to eat ferns and will eat other things and as they eat the other seedlings and things that uh, that grow it, it uh, kind of opens up the opportunity for the fern to take over and form a dense uh, monoculture and then between the roots and the shading provided by the ferns it prohibits seedlings from growing in the future. So once you have a situation that looks like that you really um, that's a situation that could persist for far, far into the future, unless not only deer numbers and deer browsing impacts were reduced, but also you, you do something to control, um, to knock those ferns back and control them to give the um, other species time to get established. So deer browse seedlings, um, they, you know, oftentimes if you look closely in a forest that's heavily impacted by deer, you'll see seedlings, but they may not be growing past the, or beyond the level of, of what the snow cover was in the winter. So now when we have snow cover, deer will go, go along and they'll nip off anything that's sticking out. And so anything that's shorter than that, very small seedlings might survive, but you'll notice that they're not, they're not getting any bigger and that um, uh, oftentimes there's just the very small ones that are present. This slide shows uh, some seedlings that have been browsed and often after they've been browsed a number of times they 
get this kind of bonsai look and they're somewhat deformed and those trees will never be uh, nice straight tall trees uh, once they've had that that level of browsing the oak seedling on the left is one that we had planted and the picture of the seedling there is about seven years after it was planted so it it really it was hanging on uh, that was it kind of in an open field situation it was hanging in there it was still surviving but it really wasn't growing I think it was about uh, nine inches tall and it really wasn't getting much taller than that because the deer would just snip it off so another way in addition to affecting the structure of the forest deer can also influence the kinds of plants that grow in the forest um, just like us deer like some species they like to eat some things over others and so as they eat the things they like, the things that they don't like have an advantage and kind of take, take over a site. And in that way, um, heavy levels of deer browsing can kind of eliminate some species from the forest, kind of simplify the number of species that are there. Um, now I show this table and some people might look and think, oh, well, birch is not highly preferred, it's not preferred, and uh, there is some variability um, you know, geographically, and you'll see different tables having different preference levels for deer. Um, I know that deer are thought to eat hobblebush, uh, which is a viburnum, a native viburnum, and they uh, they like it. it. They oftentimes eliminate eliminate it from the site when there's heavy browsing. Uh, but somebody today said that in uh, um, I think in the Tug Hill Plateau that, that they seem to not like it, that there's a lot of it there. So there is some variability ge geographically, but for the most part, they really uh, seem to like maple and ash. Um, they eat hemlock. They um, like oaks for sure. And things like beech and hot corn bean, they tend uh, really not to prefer if there's other forage available. Okay, so um, there, there's been a lot of research, there are a lot of papers out there about the effects of deer browsing on um, all types of vegetation, whether it be woody vegetation or uh, wildflowers. And, um, but I'm going to use some examples from the Allegheny National Forest in northwestern Pennsylvania tonight because they have a long history of uh, studying deer impacts to vegetation. And so they have some interesting comparisons and long-term looks at um, at how deer have impacted the forest there. So uh, back in the uh, late 70s, they actually closed deer in at densities that were known. So they fenced deer into large areas at, um, at certain known densities. And then they looked at how those specific densities, the number of deer per square mile in those exclosure or enclosures was affecting a variety of different factors. And one thing they looked at was uh, the number of wildflower species. So if you look here along the, the x-axis here, we see 10, 20, 40, 80. That's the number of deer per square mile. And if you look on the y-axis up along the side here, that's the number of wildflower species. And what I wanted you to note is just that as the number of deer gets higher, the number of wildflower species in, during their study um, declined. And that makes sense because um, just like with tree seedlings, Deer like to eat certain flowers over others, and so by eating those, they tend to um, eliminate those and then uh, favor some others. Some of the species that they like um, include trilliums. They really seem to like trilliums a lot, and trillium is that white flower in the lower right-hand corner. Here's a mayflower in the lower left-hand corner, and up here at the top is Indian cucumber root. And we'll be talking about those a little bit more as we go on. So in that same study, um, they showed that there was a loss of tree species diversity as uh, the number of deer increased. And then what this graph is showing is that those deer in that study were kept in the enclosures from 1979 to 1990, so about 11 years. And then after the study, um, in 2005, so it's 15 years late after the study, they went back and looked at um, the areas where the deer had been and looked at tree species diversity to see if it had changed. And what they found was that um, the diversity of trees was still much lower in the areas where there had been high numbers of deer closed in than in the areas with lower deer. And so that just shows that there's this legacy effect. So 
Um, what's happening now on the ground, um, when we can't grow new seedlings, is going to affect what our forests look like for a long, long time. Um, in this case, it was 15 years later, and it really, I mean, uh, for a long-lived uh, organism like a tree, that makes a lot of sense. If you don't grow a, a baby tree today, then you're not going to have a, a grown tree um, 15, 20, 30, you know, even 100 years later, it affects what's going to be there. So another way that the deer affect the forest in terms of species composition is that they tend to like to eat native plants and they tend not to like invasive species. And so as they eat the native plants, um, they uh, kind of disturb the soil. There's nothing growing there, nothing occupying the site. And that gives things like garlic mustard and Japanese barberry the opportunity to kind of move in and take over a site. And then once you have a condition like this with garlic mustard on the left here or Japanese barberry in the understory on the right, the uh, plant community is very degraded. And again, unless something is done, some kind of action to remove those invasive species and then get something else established on the site, that condition will probably persist for a long, long time. Some browse tolerant native plants can also take over. This doesn't just happen with um, invasive species, it al also happens with native plants. So I showed you the picture with the ferns before and here's another one in the, the lower right. Those ferns can be sometimes uh, either New York fern or hay scented fern. They're native species, but under the right conditions, they can really kind of take over. The same goes with beech, American beech. That's what's pictured in the, the left-hand slide. And uh, beech can uh, sprout vigorously when it's, uh, when it's browsed or disturbed. And with the beech bark disease, that, that happens much more often these days. And so as beech sprouts, it can occupy the site and prevent other things uh, from growing. And so, again, whether it be native species or invasive species that take over the site, it can take some purposeful management, which can also be expensive at times, to restore a site, even once the deer populations are, are reduced and the impact is, is reduced. So those are some ways that deer affect uh, the forest, and now I want to talk about how deer affect other wildlife. So they affect other wildlife basically by how they change the forest. Uh, they change the habitat structure and the composition. So on the left-hand slide, their picture there, you can see there's a forest with a closed canopy and pretty much nothing except some of our clumped ferns, which don't really take over a site, but there's nothing else there growing um, in the forest understory. There's no shrub layer, no understory layer, no mid canopy. And so it's kind of a, a park-like stand, not much diversity in terms of the layers of vegetation. Versus on the right-hand side where there's been a, a partial um, harvest, a partial removal of the canopy, and sunlight has been allowed in. And clearly on that site, uh, the seedlings were able to grow beyond the reach of deer. And uh, you can see there's quite a bit growing in the understory and starting to reach the uh, toward the midstory there. So on the right, there are lots of, or they're starting to be, there's at least several layers of vegetation and it looks like there'll be more in the future. On the left, there's not much there. And uh, in terms of wildlife, this um, kind of simplifies the amount of habitat that's available. And I'm gonna use birds as an example because we have a lot of different bird species and birds tend to divide the uh, habitat, forest habitat vertically. So. Um, if you have, say, a scarlet tanager that nests in the, the canopy, and then you have something like a chickadee that may be in the mid-story, um, and then maybe you have something like an oven bird that's uh, on the forest floor, a ground nesting bird. The more different layers of vegetation you have in the forest, the more different species of birds will, will be able to be present and find good habitat there. So in that same research um, study at Allegheny National Forest back in the, um, from 1980 to 1990, the, as the deer density per square mile increased, the number of songbirds also uh, decreased. And that was especially true for, or mostly true for those uh, mid-story or understory 
nesting birds, not so much for the canopy nesters or the ground nesters. But, and that makes sense because basically that um, area, that level of uh, vegetation that they need to nest was absent. Then when they went back, even uh, for birds, like 18 years later in 2008, and they looked at those areas and the deer, uh, different levels of deer density and the bird density, they found that even 18 years later, the bird density was lower. If you look at how the line goes down as the number of deer goes up on the x-axis, there were fewer birds um, in the areas with higher deer density. So that's even you know, much, much later. So I just wanted to add one other uh, study that uh, they conducted in New Jersey. They looked at forest breeding bird trends from 1980 to 2005, and they found kind of the same trend, that mid-story shrub and ground nesting birds, def uh, for the most part, have been decreasing. Their population numbers have been decreasing. So things like the oven bird and the rose-breasted grosbeak and the veery, um, or I mean the wood thrush, and then canopy nesters were generally increasing or their populations were stable. So that, um, and they attributed that also to deer impacts to uh, veg forest vegetation and the lack of that l layer of vegetation that's needed by those species to nest. So um, not only can deer have an effect on other wildlife, but uh, they also can have an effect on their own habitat as well. So in forests where those layers of vegetation are no longer present. There isn't a lot of winter browse available for deer. There isn't high quality forage remaining because it's basically been eliminated. And so deer really can affect the quality of their own habitat as well as other wildlife. So now we get to the what can you do? Well, if you wanna know um, what what the deer impacts are to forest vegetation in in your woods or in properties near in your area or maybe you work for a land trust or you're a forester and you want to know um, how much deer are impacting your clients woods um, one thing you can do is just kind of do a really quick visual assessment that's what we call the you know you're in trouble when kind of walkabout so you can take a look around and find out you know take a look and see if there are spring wildflowers, especially those that deer really like, things like trillium. You can see if they're present. And for example, in the, the picture here, you can see this is a trillium plant and um, it's present, but it's not very tall and it's not flowering. And um, deer can affect the flower's ability to produce flowers as well. So if they're eating, feeding on the trillium, it will be less likely to, to flower because it needs all the nutrients it can get just to, to grow. Um, so you can look around and find, do you find trillium? Is it short? Is it tall? Is it flowering? Um, is there a variety of different tree seedling types present? Or is it just beech or um, just hop hornbeam, for example? Um, are any seedlings growing to five feet tall, growing beyond the reach of deer and um, getting into the next layer? Or is just beech growing into the next layer? And other things like uh, you have a a forest floor that's carpeted with sugar maple seedlings, but maybe they're only eight inches tall. And so you know that they were protected by the snow layer, but that probably as they grow, they'll get nipped off. Um, and then is there direct evidence of browsing? So the slide I showed earlier where that, that oak had been browsed, um, you know, you can look and see, do you see direct evidence that deer have been eating the seedlings? So that's what you can do to get a quick idea of um, the deer impacts on your property, but you can also collect information on your land and monitor the vegetation over time to see if conditions are changing. And the benefits to that, you know, taking a deeper look and getting a little bit more involved is that you get to have an up close look at your land on at least a yearly basis. So it gives you a reason to get out there and take a close look at what's happening. It also gives you a way to know if deer are preventing you from growing or regenerating a new forest for the future. And it can be a good indication of when it might be safe or not safe to have a harvest. If you're going to be removing a large proportion of your canopy trees, but deer impacts are very, very significant on the, the seedlings in the understory, you may not be able to grow a new forest when those trees are removed. 
So it's a very good thing to, uh, to assess prior to a harvest. So to allow volunteers and landowners and foresters to do that, we've developed AVID. And AVID stands for, again, Assessing Vegetation Impacts from Deer. And it's a rapid assessment method for evaluating deer impacts to forest vegetation. So uh, it's been developed for use by landowners and foresters and volunteers, and land trust personnel, and basically anyone who wants to get involved with monitoring um, deer impacts to forest. What you uh, do basically is go out and collect data, either on your own land, your client's land, or land in your community. Um, and we're specifically looking at uh, a few key indicator wildflower species that we know deer feed on and or tree or shrub seedlings. The method that we've developed is a little bit simpler than and the methods that typically are used by foresters where you go in and you set up a plot and you catalog everything that's growing within that plot. Um, that's a very uh, valuable method to use to understand the vegetation types that are growing on a site and see what's changing over time. This is much simpler though. It takes a lot less time. And what it's really going to tell you is what is happening to those uh, seedlings that I'm observing over time. So why would you want to be involved with this? Uh, there are a number of things that you can get from it personally. Um, you can learn about the ecology of your land and learn to identify the, those uh, few spring wildflower species that I mentioned, plus a few tree seedlings, uh, if you don't already know some. Um, I know that you can develop an eye for recognizing key signs of deer impacts to your woods. I know through this uh, developing this protocol, I really started to look much more closely at wildflowers than I used to. And um, I'm, I'm noticing that I can tell a lot uh, about what I see when I walk into the forest with this new, um, you know, so kind of like a new tool in my hand. I uh, could tell before by looking at the seedling species, tree species that were growing, that told me one thing, but the wildflowers helped me to develop a kind of a deeper understanding of what's going on. And then also you can document the health of New York forests or even if you're not if you're not from New York you can participate and use this protocol and track changes over time and there'll be the opportunity to contribute to a statewide uh, database actually the database is also open to people from other states but you can enter the information online and contribute to information. And so this project is a collaborative effort with DEC and also with SUNY ESF. And uh, DEC is looking for a way to um, get more data to understand uh, and develop a uh, deeper understanding or broader understanding of what's happening in terms of deer impacts to our forests across the state. Okay, so AV AVID focuses really on key wildflower species and or tree or shrub seedlings. So you can decide to monitor just trillium, for example, if you have trillium on your property, or just uh, yellow poplar, for example. Or you could do um, a couple of different tree seedling species, or you can uh, do both monitor both wildflowers and uh, one or two uh, tree species. It's really up to you and your comfort level and also your, your interest and what's available on the property. So there are two basic methods to this protocol, to the AVID protocol. There's uh, the first one, the spring wildflowers, and we focus on four species that are uh, broadly distributed and also uh, known to be eaten by deer. Um, and I say species, but really there are multiple species of trillium alone, so it's not just four species. It's it's more than that. Uh, you can see we have white trillium in the lower left-hand corner. There's a purple trillium or wake robin trillium. And then there's a picture of mayflower down here in the lower right. And uh, jack in the pulpit is another species and Indian cucumber. And I'll sh show some pictures of those uh, a little later. So the benefit of using spring wildflowers is that they tend to respond a little bit quick, more quickly and earlier to a decrease in deer browsing pressure than seedlings might. So in just a few years, you might see um, those wildflowers kind of rebounding if deer impacts are reduced, whereas for seedlings, it could take a little longer. 
They also tend to respond when fern or other interfering vegetation is present. So if you had that monoculture of ferns on the forest floor, like I showed in a couple of slides, you wouldn't expect to get many seedlings growing. They don't do well under those conditions, but wildflowers seem to still grow all right. And maybe that's because those spring wildflowers that we're looking at, um, they're starting to grow in the, the early season before the ferns have kind of come up and greened up. So they might uh, do well better under those conditions. And they also do well even in shaded conditions. So in stands that are very, very dense with a lot of canopy closure, um, seedlings are going to grow very quickly regardless of the deer browsing impacts. They'll grow slowly um, without much light, but the wildflower seedlings um, might do quite well even in the shaded conditions. The second method is woody seedlings. So when we say woody seedlings, we mean either uh, shrubs or trees. And um, for those, we are suggesting that you try to select, if you have on your site, one species that is not a species preferred by deer and one that is preferred. And that's because uh, say you decided to monitor American beach and you went out and you found that okay, my beech seedlings are able to grow beyond the reach of deer. Well, that tells us one thing. That tells us that things that deer don't like are growing pretty well, but it doesn't tell us what about the things that deer uh, do like. What about maple or oak or those other species that we're interested in? So by selecting one of each, it can kind of tell, um, put together more pieces of the puzzle, I guess you might say. Now, in some cases, you may not have anything except species that deer don't prefer. And in that case, it's fine uh, to just monitor those. So the target for uh, the woody seedling method is seedlings that are greater than six inches and less than four feet tall, and ideally less than three feet tall. Um, and the reason for that is that really small seedlings have a lower chance of surviving anyway. Um, because they're young and they're new, and that's you know usually you have a lot of very small seedlings, and only a certain number make it to the next height category, et cetera. Um, and also, you want to be tracking these seedlings over time for several years to see what the impacts are and if they're able to grow. And if they're uh, too close to four feet, that doesn't give you much time to monitor them before they're uh, out of the reach of deer. So I'm just gonna walk you through some of the steps to implementing the protocol. Uh, so the first step is to select a stand in your woods. So you may have uh, several different stands on the property that you're planning to monitor. And a stand is an area with distinctly different conditions. So you might have a hemlock stand or an oak pine forest or northern hardwood stand. And uh, similar, if you think about it, to um, a farmer's field. So a farmer might have corn in one field and pumpkins in another. And so um, you may have you know, different stands on one property. And you can select one stand or you can select more than one stand, depending on how ambitious you are and how many, um, how many plots you're willing to put in. So once you've selected your stand to monitor, then you want to uh, go out and take a look around and look for where in your stand you want to put your plots. There's some places that you want to avoid. So for example, any place that's very steep, and so I have pictured here a slope of, uh, that's pretty steep, over 70%. Any place that's really steep, you want to avoid monitoring the seedlings or flowers there because Deer might not have uh, as much access to those sites, and so it really wouldn't be representative to, uh, to your forest overall. So uh, things sometimes tend to grow a little bit better on steep slopes uh, because deer aren't able to access them as easily and are less likely to be feeding there. Um, another thing you want to avoid are sites with a lot of rock cover. So more than 65% rock cover is not good. Um, you know, you'll have less soil there. Um, seedlings might grow very poorly to begin with because the site conditions aren't very good. So you want to avoid those conditions. And then you also want to avoid areas where uh, ferns, grasses, invasive species are covering a whole lot of the site. If that's not possible, possible, then you might want to prioritize the wildflower method for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, 
All right, the, the next um, step is to decide, whoops, sorry about that, is to decide whether you're going to use the, the seedling or wildflower method. And so um, if the canopy or sub canopy cover is, um, is more than 50%, so basically as you're looking up toward the sky, if more than half of the sky is blocked from your view, then the wildflower method might be ideal. If less than half the sky is blocked from your view, uh, such as this, the picture with the nice puffy clouds down there, then probably either method will work equally as well for, for you. And you want to do a little bit of reconnaissance. So uh, what I mean by that is you want to go out, you want to take a look around, you want to see what seedlings are growing on your site. So which species do you have? Do you have beech? Do you have ash? And are there enough seedlings present? And which ones are the most abundant? So what do you have uh, the most of? Um, what are you likely to find the most to be able to monitor? And you want to do the same thing for wildflowers. Are the target species that we're looking for present? And if so, where are they present? Are they broadly distributed across your site or there are just a few patches? So um, they might not be a good candidate for monitoring. So generally just taking a look around and getting to know your site a little bit. And then you would like to consider your own seasonal availability. So I know for myself, there are times of the year that I'm busier than others. And so you may know that, uh, that you're not available usually in, uh, from May to till the end of June. Maybe you have very busy springs um, for one reason or another, um, and you can't get out on the ground to do this. Um, so then maybe the spring wildflowers wouldn't be for you. The, um, the timeline for the spring wildflowers, um, although you can see trilliums, for example, growing from early May until maybe sometimes even uh, mid-August, they tend to, to grow and flower and reach their about their maximum height, they stay at until the end of June. And then they start to kind of wilt and wilt over a little bit. It's a little bit more difficult to tell whether or not they've flowered, and that's one of the things that you're going to note on your data sheets. And um, so really for spring wildflowers, you know, the May to uh, the end of June is really the best time to monitor those. For woody seedlings, um, you know, trees or shrubs, you can monitor them as long as the leaves are on the seedlings from June to September. Or if you know your seedlings very well without the leaves on, you can really monitor them at any time of the year. Um, as long as you're sure, you're certain of your identification skills for the species that you choose. Uh, step four is to start setting up your monitoring plots. So within any given stand that you choose, say you choose your uh, northern hardwood stand, you're going to um, try to set up ideally about six plots, each of which contain at least five individual seedlings of the species you want to monitor. So um, say I plan to monitor oak, for Northern Red Oak, I'm going to look for places, six places where I can find at least five oak seedlings um, growing. And overall, our goal is to mark and measure a total of 25 to 30 seedlings or 25 to 30 total wildflowers of any given species we choose. Um, so that would be, that's where we come up with the six plots, each containing five. That would get you 30 individual seedlings to uh, mark and measure and tag, or 20, 30 different wildflowers, individual wildflowers to mark and measure and tag. The plots are going to be at least 25 feet apart um, on center, and uh, really we want to try to distribute the, the plots. Um, you don't want to put them all in one spot together because we're trying to capture some of the variability across your forest site. So some spots might be more moist than others. Some might be more accessible to deer than others. And so we want to try to capture a variety of seedlings in, in a few different places across, across the landscape. But um, you can, if it's helpful to you, you can, they don't have to be in a, in a row. They can be in a row. Um, you can lo locate them along a transect, which is just a line that you can set up in your forest. You can use flagging or something to, to, um, to kind of flag out a line in your forest for ease of relocating the plots in the future, but that's not necessary. If you have a really open forest understory with not much vegetation growing, then maybe you don't need that to refine your, pl your plots. Um, if you have a, 
a recent harvest and a lot of vegetation growing, then you may want to um, establish them a little more systematically for ease of relocating them. If you choose to do both methods, so using both wildflowers and tree seedlings, or even uh, two, just two species of tree seedlings, so say oak and maple, you might be able to use the same six plots for all for two, two different species, and that's ideal in terms of you know, being efficient with your time to set up plots, but it's probably not likely that you'll be able to do that. Um, you might be able to share some plots, but not all. Um, at least that's been our experience when we've been putting in um, plots to test the methods ourselves. So I've drawn a little schematic to illustrate what I mean by that. Um, in this picture, I've uh, decided that I'm going to monitor, monitor, say, white trillium and red oak. And the trillium is the red stars, and the red oak is the green triangles. So I go out in my forest stand, and I look, and I see where, roughly where red oak and trillium are distributed. And so I look at, for places, I want to monitor both, so I'm looking for places where there's a high density of both species together. So in this scenario, I found six places where I can find five trilliums at least and five red oak seedlings in the same area. So I'm going to establish six plots and be able to capture them both. In this slide, however, in this scenario, I go out and it's going to be a little bit more difficult. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to find maybe four plots, this one, this one, this one and this one, where I can uh, use, you know, mark and measure both species in the same plots. But then I'm going to have to establish maybe two extra plots just for trillium to get up to my 30 count and two more for red oak to get up to my 30 count. So there are a variety of ways that you can, um, you know, get up to your, your full count for multiple species. And um, you can do what, what you need to to minimize your effort and use duplicate plots if it's available, if it's a possibility. Otherwise, you, um, you need to add some plots. So when I talk about a plot, what do I mean? Um, we're using uh, plots that are six feet in radius or 12 feet in diameter. And so um, here's a picture of our plot. You go out. You uh, mark a plot center with uh, maybe PVC painted with orange. You can use a, a short wooden stake with some flagging tied onto it. Anything that you can use to relocate your plot and to mark the center. And then we also use a compass and we find the four cardinal directions. So we find uh, north, south, east, and west. And we've marked that in, in this photo. We marked ours with a, with a pin flag. And those little pin flags are available at Home Depot or Lowe's. And they can be really handy for marking. And so the reason we're marking these, uh, we call these quadrants then. So each quarter of the circle is one quadrant. So you have the, where the north flag is and the east flag is. That's the northeast quadrant then the southeast quadrant and then northwest and southwest. And the reason we've divided it up like this is because in this picture, it doesn't make much difference. Refinding the seedlings after you tag them might be pretty easy because there's not a lot of vegetation. But in the future, um, if vegetation continues to grow or if you have a site, again, that has a high density of seedlings on the forest floor, it might be a little bit more difficult to refine them. And so by marking where they occur within the plot in those quadrants, it just helps you um, to be able to relocate them a little bit more easily. We suggest in addition to the six plots or, that you, or more plots that you set up for um, conducting the protocol that you may want to establish one or two extra plots with the species that you're targeting and uh, put up a simple deer exposure. Now this deer exposure is, is more than a simple deer exposure. It's much more sturdy than what you need, but I just wanted to use it to illustrate that. Um, this is an exposure in a state park near us where there is a lot of deer pressure. And you can see there's virtually nothing on the forest floor. Maybe a few tiny seedlings hanging around um, outside the fence. This fence, uh, this exposure I think has been up for five years. And you can see that inside, there is some maple regeneration starting to take place and it's starting to grow quite well. So, um, so the benefit to putting in a couple of extra plots and fencing them, maybe with some uh, metal garden fencing and some, some T-posts, 
um, is that you get to see what what could you expect to get? What is, you know, what, what would it look like if you didn't have any deer browsing? And it gives you a kind of a baseline of, of what your expectations might be. Um, and then you can compare what happens inside to what happens outside and see, you know, if, if what uh, you're looking at outside Side looks just like what's inside, then maybe your impacts by deer aren't that heavy. Um, if you're getting a lot of growth inside an exclosure, but not many in your plots that are outside, then maybe um, your deer browsing impacts are pretty significant. Now I'll note that what's inside isn't really natural either because that's the complete absence of browsing, which you wouldn't expect to experience under natural conditions. But it does uh, provide a nice baseline. Okay, for the first method for spring wildflowers, you're going to find your five individuals, you're going to mark the flowers and measure the height of each, and I'll uh, show you what we're going to mark them with in just a minute. The height is measured from the ground at the stem level, so where the ground comes out of, or where the stem comes out of the ground, um, to the highest whorl of leaves. So for example, this trillium on the right you can see that the highest whorl of leaves is right here where the arrow is, and then the flower comes out of the top of that, and you're not going to measure to the top of the flower, but to the top of the highest whorl of leaves. Uh, the same thing on the left, this is Indian cucumber root, and I'm showing right there, you can see the little berries forming. We're going to measure just to the base of uh, the highest whorl of leaves there. We want to measure the natural height. So basically, wherever it's falling, that's where we measure. We don't stand the flower up and measure it that way. We want to measure it as it's growing naturally. OK, so here are a couple of things. There's, there's no perfect way to, to mark wildflowers, uh, not that we've found anyway. And if anybody has any experience with this and has suggestions, we're definitely open to it. We've tried a variety of different things. We've tried little garden stakes, like the little plant stakes, the little plastic markers or wooden markers that are numbered and placed in the ground behind the flowers. And they're very easily disturbed. Sometimes if the soil is in deep or if it's rocky, they don't go in deep enough. And so you can lose them pretty easily. And what I've found that I like the best is um, I these metal um, sod stakes, they're called. They're about four inches. And you can buy them at Lowe's or Home Depot and in the garden department. And I use those with a numbered uh, tree tag, actually, this round tree tag. It can be ordered from something like forestry suppliers or maybe Ben Meadows. And um, I put the, the stake through the hole in the tree tag and then put it into the ground behind the flower, trying not to disturb the root system of the, the individual plant. Now the problem with those is that they're not very visible, and so I've been double marking them then with like a four inch uh, brightly covered, colored golf tee just so that I can find them again. It's surprising how difficult it can be to refine them. So those are some examples of what you might use. Um, I'll show you that what we've been marking trees with too in a minute, and I think that the tree tags we're using might be able to be used in conjunction with the sod stakes uh, as well for a good option for wildflowers. So again, the species we're looking at for wildflowers are trillium, and it could be white trillium, it could be painted trillium. Um, and I just want to point out that, that the more closely you start looking for these things, the more you tend to find. So you know, this, if you're just walking, you're not looking too closely, you might see uh, these large trillium plants and they're flowering and they're really nice. Um, but what you might not be seeing if you're walking through the woods are these smaller trilliums. Say you have a lot of deer impacts and deer are eating all your trilliums. You might uh, not notice these unless you're using this protocol and you're starting to look at your forest floor more closely. So this trillium is um, short, you know, it's present, but it's fairly short. It's not growing very tall and it's not flowering. And then if you continue to look, you might notice, wow, I have a lot of really small trilliums. This is a trillium. Here's a trillium that just has one leaf when they're uh, very young. They don't have three leaves. We're not monitoring them in that stage. We're waiting until they have three leaves. But um, you might notice that, oh, I do have trillium. I have the potential to have it, uh, but it's not growing tall and it's not flowering. Here's some other trilliums, the purple trillium, the painted trillium. And here's Jack in the Pulpit, which we've also included. Jack in the Pulpit is not a preferred species, but I kind of liken it to like the beach of the wildflower world. Uh, it actually has, contains oxalic acid and um, isn't very good to eat necessarily, 
but it's kind of one of the last things that remains in a highly disturbed forest with a lot of deer impacts. And because of that, um, it can be, you know, the one thing that's left for you to monitor. And even with Jack in the pulpit, I've noticed that, you know, if you have a roadside cut or a steep slope in an area that otherwise has heavy deer impacts, that you'll see that the Jack in the pulpit growing on that steep slope tends to be much taller and be flowering more often than those that you'll find in the rest of your forest. And so I think it is a good indicator um, and maybe the only thing that, that you have, have left. This is Indian cucumber root, and this is also a good uh, deer indicator. They do like to eat it. And here's uh, Canada Mayflower. It grows in very dense clumps, and really the, uh, the percent of it that's flowering can be pretty indicative of deer impacts. Okay, so then moving on to the woody seedling method. You can choose any seedling, any um, tree species that uh, you have present, as I mentioned. You tag the seedlings and you measure their height and uh, you mark, oh, here I have to mark the flowers and measure the height. That's not correct because they don't have flowers. So you measure the height of the seedling. You measure it from the ground at the level of the stem base to the end of the newest woody growth. So you're not measuring the, uh, the end of the leaf. You're measuring just the, the new woody to the end of the new woody growth. And again, measuring the natural height rather than extending extending it manually or standing it up. Okay, so here's what I mean by measuring it to the highest point of new woody growth. Here's a uh, yellow poplar seedling, and here's where you would measure. So from the very base, wherever it's coming out of the ground, to this point here, this is the leaf growing out. You wouldn't measure it to up here, just to this spot. And these are the tags that we're using for seedlings. They kind of look like a bread tie or a, a little version of a, a zip tie. And uh, we've been buying them on large rolls. They're very inexpensive. We've been getting them from forestry suppliers. They come in, in a very big roll. And you can get them pre-numbered, which we really like because sometimes for anybody who's used a Sharpie to mark things on plastic, sometimes it wears off. So you can use a permanent marker. Um, if you don't have them pre-numbered, but you may have to refresh it annually to make sure that the numbers are readable, um, or you can get them uh, pre-numbered. And we put them on so that they're not too tight around the stem. You don't want to lock in moisture or kind of strangle the stem, but uh, tight enough that it's not going to blow off in the wind or kind of fall off if something walks by um, and brushes by them. Once you've selected your seedlings and marked them um, for collecting data, you have two different options. We have paper data forms in the manual that we've, been, we've developed. Um, you can take those out in the field the old-fashioned way, collect your data, and then come back and enter your data online at our website, uh, which is going to be called aviddeer.com. Well, we have the uh, we have the site. We just haven't uh, gone live with it yet. We're still in beta testing mode. But aviddeer.com is something to remember, and you can enter your data there. Or we're also having uh, smartphone apps developed for both Apple and Android phones, and those will be available hopefully in April. We're going to be beta testing them very soon, we hope, and they will be available on, um, both the, uh, on iTunes and in the Google Play Store for download. So the smartphone apps you'll be able to just take out with you, collect the data with your phone, and then even if you don't have cell service where you're collecting the data, it will upload as soon as you do have cell service. So how long should you collect the data? We're asking everyone to um, collect data once a year and to collect that data within two weeks of the initial date that you set up your plots and took your initial measurements. So for example, if I go out June 1st and I measure my trillium and collect my data, the next year um, I'll want to go out within a week on either side of that date, so either within the week before or the week after the date that I, I collected it um, this year. Uh, it takes a while. Once deer, even if deer pressure is, uh, deer browsing pressure is reduced through hunting or other means, it can take a while for that uh, reduction in deer browsing pressure to show up in your vegetation height. So in some cases, uh, it's going to show up a little bit more quickly for wildflowers, maybe in the percent of flowers that you see, and maybe in the, the, uh, the height 
of your flowers, but even then it can take three years or maybe four years. Um, and for seedlings, maybe a little bit longer. So you wanna, this is a long-term um, effort, uh, but hopefully once you establish your plots the first year, that's gonna take the most time. Going back and measuring them in, in future years uh, should take just a fraction of the, the time it took initially. And then you can also share data collection responsibility with others. So if you're a land trust, you belong to a land trust or work for a land trust and they have multiple properties they'd like to monitor. You know, you might be able to monitor some and have somebody else monitor some of the others. And there, I'll show you on the data uh, on the website that you, you can share your data uh, with others. So nobody else can see the data that you upload um, except other people that you designate, but you can share, share your site. Okay, and now I'd like to actually go to the website and show you what it's like. So you just bear with me for a minute here and I'm gonna to try to bring that up. Okay, so here's what the site looks like. Um, let's see, I did not log in in advance, I don't think. So when you first visit the site, You'll be given the opportunity to create a user ID and password that will be unique to you. You can log in. And then we have a lot of information. So uh, we've developed, as I said, a hard copy manual or a PDF file, which uh, I'll give you the, the link to that. But eventually, when this goes live, it'll be under resources. So you'll be able to go and print the whole thing and read through it if you'd like or take it out in the field. But also, all the information from that manual is here on the, on the website. So we have, you know, all about deer impacts, you know, talking about the things that I've talked about during this presentation, what to look for, signs and symptoms. Um, then we also have user guides, so how to go out and find a site and how to implement the spring wildflower method and the woody seedling method, some information about uh, putting in wild or exclosures. And then we also have uh, this My Data section. So this is basically where you're gonna go to enter your data once you collect it. All right, so you go first to My Data and you will enter your site. So I entered you know, My New Test and um, I'll just go and show you what was put in there. Now there are some glitches that still need to be worked out. That's why this has not gone live yet. So some things are not quite right. For example, somebody noticed we have percent for basal area and that, that will be different. That won't be percent. Um, but for your site, you'll be asked what town, what county, what state. You'll be asked to put in a GPS location and uh, you can get that actually from Google Earth. If, you, if you're not collecting it with a GPS, you don't have a GPS with you or you don't own a GPS, uh, you can get that from that location from Google Earth. And there's a certain format we're looking for. We're looking for decimal degree format, and those instructions are in the manual. Um, and when you go uh, to enter new data into the form, um, there's a chance to record what are the four most common overstory tree species in your site, and what are the four most common seedling or shrub species. And that's uh, so that it can give you an idea. Are the canopy species that you have currently, your mature species in your forest, are you regrowing those on your forest floor or is something different coming up, which might indicate either a change in the conditions of your stand from, from when the uh, overstory trees grew or maybe deer impacts. Um, and so you'll want to record those on the, uh, the hard copy data sheet or in uh, the smartphone app. Then you can add, say you're doing, you're measuring uh, spring wildflowers. Um, you can add a plot. Okay, so here I'm gonna say this is plot number two because I had one. Um, I'm, you can enter your name and enter anybody else's name who's going with you. You can enter the latitude and longitude, as I mentioned the ground and shrub cover percentage, the sub canopy closure percentage, the canopy closure, basal area, that's optional. And then whether it's um, part of, in a deer exclosure or not, yes or no. And um, it won't let me go forward here because 
I'm pretty sure because it's uh, some of those things are mandatory. So probably won't let me save that. No, it won't. So I'm just going to go back. And I'm going to show one that I already did. So you have the opportunity to enter the plot information. And then also here you can go and enter your individual seedlings. So say I'm going to put in spring wildflower item. It's my, say I'm doing trillium. This is trillium number two. I'm going to select trillium. I'm going to say it's in the northeast quadrant, so I can refine it later. And I'm going to save that. And then it's going to allow me to measure that or put it in my measurement. So was the plant alive? Yes, it was. What height? I'm going to say it was, I think we can measure to the closest quarter inch, but that the, uh, the decimal function isn't working on this. I noticed that's a... Um, something that we need to fix. So uh, for now, I'm just gonna put in two inches. You can put in the date. We're also, they put in time, but we're gonna have them remove that. And then is it flowering? Yes, it's flowering. Good, that's a good thing. And we save it. And, and there was an error, but in the, once it's, all the bugs are ironed out, there won't be an error and it will go on and we'll be able to enter our next, uh, our next seedling. Okay, so now we're going to get out of that and go back to the PowerPoint. And go down to where I was. Oops. Okay, so um, what if you go out and you find out deer impacts on your property are substantial? Now what? Well, you can uh, take several steps, most of which you've probably heard of before. You can manage to reduce the deer numbers when possible, and especially prior to a timber harvest. If you can get deer numbers knocked back before the canopy is opened up, then your seedlings will have a better chance of getting a little bit of a head start. Uh, you can use fencing to exclude deer, and even small exclosures are beneficial. Um, Pete's experimenting right now with several different methods, new methods of, um, of creating exclosures to protect uh, areas from deer browsing, and um, he's got some, some neat experiments underway to hopefully uh, find some new, new uh, not very expensive methods and easy to put up methods for landowners to use. You can leave a good amount of woody material, aka treetops, on the ground following a harvest, or even if you don't have a harvest, you could um, do some, some thinning, some light thinning, and remove things that aren't very valuable and just let them lay on the ground to try to provide some protection from browsing. If you leave enough treetops on the ground, we've been doing some research at our are not teaching in research forest over the last about eight years, looking at um, the benefits of leaving some woody material on the forest floor. And if you leave enough, it can provide protection for just long enough for seedlings to escape um, the impacts of deer. So in this picture, you can see our uh, intern, Ryan. He's standing at the edge of a large pile. We had about three trees uh, directionally felled kind of on top of one another and left the tops as kind of a giant massive pile there. You can see deer have browsed um, in about as far as their neck, the neck can reach there. And then beyond that, the seedlings are growing um, past the reach of deer. And then you can also keep monitoring and submitting data. Your data um, combined with that of others in your region will help DEC to assess deer impacts to forests and can help them to decide uh, what what management targets they might want to make for an area or areas where maybe deer impacts are very high or where maybe they're not so high. Um, the data that you enter, you're going to be able to plot and see your own data over time. We're going to have functions built in so that you can see um, how your vegetation is progressing and be able to look at graphs of your own data and then also hopefully to be able to compare it with um, other people in your region to see how how are my seedlings growing relative to how others in, in my local area or in my wildlife management unit um, are growing. 
And what does success look like? How do you know if you are, if deer impacts have been relieved to the point where you can get good regeneration? Um, and there are a few ways. One is seeing changes on the ground. So wildflowers appear that hadn't been there before. They're taller and they're flowering more often, those target species that we mentioned. Um, if you put up some exclosures, then outside the fenced areas are beginning to look more like the, the inside the fenced areas. So you know that, that there's been a release from browsing pressure. And seedlings, especially those species that are preferred by deer, um, are able to grow past the height where deer can reach them. And that's real success when it comes to regeneration. Until the seedlings get to that point, you are not out of the woods, so to speak. So, um, so that's what, what you really want to look for. In terms of resources, um, aviddeer.com should be going live by the end of April. So keep checking back. That's what the, uh, the website that I showed you. Today, that's uh, what it will be called and where you'll be able to find it. It's pretty easy to remember. Currently, we have our AVID instruction manual um, at the website that's listed right there. We're going to be moving it also to aviddeer.com uh, before it goes live, so you'll be able to download it there. Uh, that manual is marked draft, and we're going to uh, keep it marked draft. We've been testing this protocol with volunteer groups and uh, like master naturalists and master forest owners and with foresters and with landowners and um, getting their feedback as they try the protocol and uh, making some revisions as we go along. And so we're going to probably keep that manual marked draft for another field season until we make sure that we have every all the bugs ironed out. And uh, at that point, it'll be marked final. But don't be, uh, don't be discouraged when you see that it's marked draft. It is the, the correct version. It's just it's the latest that we have. If it's the March version, um, it's just going to be continue to be draft for a little while longer. And then you can also check the website above for a notification that this, the smartphone apps are available. So we'll put a notice on aviddeer.com and also at the Wildlife Control info website to let everyone know that those those um, apps are available feel free to contact me with questions my email is at the bottom of this slide um, or if you'd like to be notified of upcoming trainings that we might be having this spring um, you can contact me and I can let you know if there's anything in your in your area uh, so thank you all very much and um, if you have any questions I'd be happy to try to answer them for you Christy, thank you very much. This was, again, very well done. Um, as people are preparing to type in questions, let me give kind of some, I don't know, logistical or administrative updates. So for those of you that are interested in continuing education credits, you provided all the information you needed to when you registered for the webinar. So I'll be uh, using that information and sending out notifications that you participated within a few days. Um, all of these webinars, this and all previous webinars, are available on YouTube. So uh, if you go to youtube.com slash forest connect, then uh, you can find those there. And then um, Christy mentioned several studies and research projects. Those will be those that literature will be available in the resources page of the avidir.com. So do you have a sense, Christy, I don't want to put you on, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you know like late March, early May, is there a date to roll out avidir.com or just as when things are available or when uh, things, when things, yeah, I mean, we don't want to rush it of course, but what's your right. sense? Well, our target was um, early April, um, but it's not really in our control. We have other other people are developing the site for us, so um, we're we're still hoping, certainly that the avidir.com could be up early April, and that will in the next two weeks we'll have the app to beta testing and, and get it right back out. So um, April is still our our target. Okay, good. So there are a couple of questions. Carl has, do you want to, you can see them or do you want me to sure. read them? No, I can see Carl's question. Um, okay. Carl, you're asking any thoughts on the use of deer repellents for small areas of the woodlot? Um, I don't know that deer repellents have been shown to be effective in uh, a woodlot situation. Sometimes, um, Deer repellents can be useful uh, in a suburban landscape if you're trying to 
protect just a few shrubs or something like that, but they need to be reapplied in the event of rain. And really, in terms of broad scale application, it wouldn't be very uh, feasible to go out and respray every time the weather wasn't going to be good. I think there's also temperature limits, maybe, and um, that the time when you want to protect your seedlings in the woods um, is winter when they might not be very effective and it would be very costly. Whereas in, in the landscape, in landscaping situations, I think they're often used during the growing seasons. So it's a different kind of scenario. Um, and then you also asked any thoughts on solar powered with battery backup electric fencing to exclude deer. Um, solar powered fencing has been used like in garden situations with some success, um, maybe in some agricultural situations, but I think in a forested setting, you wouldn't have enough sun in, in many cases to, uh, to, to charge your fence, um, consistently and uh, yes if it's not charged consistently deer will take the opportunity to uh, take advantage of that so I probably limited um, limited application there um, let's see since it takes a while for the forest to recover from deer browse is there an issue with over thinning of deer in larger forest areas um, I'm not sure, Dana, that I understand the question. I guess um, I would say that it's important to keep the number of deer down for long enough for the vegetation to recover. So in your local area or near your property, you need to you know, keep the number, the browsing um, low enough for long enough for those seedlings to uh, get higher than the five foot level. And uh, in some sites, you know, seedlings can grow rather quickly in a really good um, fertile soil. Uh, maybe you'll get fast growth. In other sites, it might be slower. And it's also going to depend on the amount of light that's reaching the forest floor and how long that'll take. So, so yes, um, it's important to consider that when you think about how long you need to keep deer numbers at a lower level if you, you want to get um, adequate regeneration. Christy, can I um, respond to that as well? Sure. I, I'm wondering if that's, because another way, and I don't want to put words in Dana's mouth, hi Dana, um, but the other way to, the other word, kind of word change would be, is, is there a concern with over thinning of trees in, um, it's, uh, the screen's bouncing, yeah, uh, over thinning, <laughs> over thinning of trees. And, and, and I think there is, I mean, and it's, you know, thinning is a very specific word silviculturally, but the point, the, the, the bigger point is, you know, what do you do if you have too many deer? And, um, I'm in a uh, strong advocate for the fact that, you know, the trees that you leave behind are going to produce the seed or could produce the seed that would grow the next forest. So if you're, so exploitive harvesting practices, which may not be over thinning, it may just be um, selectively inappropriate thinning that remove the seed source can have combined with deer can have very negative effects. So all of the kind of the principles of silviculture that need to come into play in terms of controlling the deer, controlling interfering vegetation and using correct uh, so cultural systems are important so okay thanks Pete um, let's see Carl also asked about um, whether there are any thoughts on using like brushwood hedges made of cut branches and that's an excellent question that uh, Peter can answer he's got a, a new research project that's going to be looking at something just like that this summer so right thanks Christy and thanks Carl so we've uh, it's actually started off as a management project where there are two areas at the Arnott Forest near Ithaca where uh, the next harvest had to be a regeneration cut so the the stand structure was such that we there was not an opportunity for two additional entries we had one additional entry well two entries uh, the second entry is going to be an overstory removal so the first entry um, we have to do something very definitive in terms of regenerating it. So in both cases, we're working with loggers who are using two different harvesting systems, but who have agreed under contract to build a slash fence that is effectively 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide and sufficiently dense to exclude deer. Um, so one, the first 
a contractor showed up on Monday, the contractor using a feller buncher and a grapple skitter, and they're going to use primarily directional felling and then removal of the stems uh, so that they can, you know, strategically position crowns in the right place. The other logger uh, we expect any day, and he's going to be using an excavator with a thumb. So both of these have, uh, I think they're going to be pretty neat to see. We'll see if they work. Obviously, we hope that they work. Okay. Um, let's see. Brett asks or has says that he's had great results with liquid deer fence and rabbit repellent used in an orchard next to his woods. He reapplies every six weeks. Thankfully, he had a mild winter until today. Yes, today it would be very difficult. Um, but okay, thanks for sharing your experience. Um, Charlie's asks, Charlize asks, um, our forest is losing all the seedlings except for beech. Would small enclosures help? What size and what height? Um, yes, I think small enclosures could help. Um, the size and height, it depends. If it's a small enclosure, um, geez, I don't know. Pete, would you have a recommendation? I mean, height-wise, if you are just enclosing a small area, it doesn't have to be as high. It can be maybe like five or six feet rather than eight feet. But I'm not sure about what size. You'd want to include a, a large enough area that you'd have a good shot at getting at least one mature tree out of it in the future. And I, I'm not sure what that might be. So we're, we're doing, um, we're actually we're wrapping up a project that was looking at patch, patch regeneration and fencing. And so we were working with, uh, patch sizes, and, and the patches were not necessarily cleared, but they had reduced uh, stem density. So there's a, a big infusion of sunlight, but not necessarily a, 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 re a total removal of the canopy. We were looking at things between a tenth of an acre and up to about maybe not two acres in size. And so we're testing. We have a, a one mesh fence is five feet tall, and then we have a high tensile fence that is eight feet tall. So and deer can jump an eight foot fence. It's just whether they're willing to go to that effort. In the first year, we've shown that there's a significant difference inside and outside the fence using the AVID protocol. Uh, but there's also not much incentive for the deer to jump in um, for the first year. So the, the test will be in years two, three, four, and seven uh, as the inside looks a lot different and becomes more attractive to deer than the outside. So I'd say for size, uh, smallest I would go would be maybe a tenth to a quarter of an acre uh, and the height you'd want to go at least five feet and we're, we're developing a fact sheet that will also be listed and or, or put into the resources of the of a fact sheet on these two fencing methods that will go into the resources on avidDeer.com. Okay, great. Um, Ernest asks, uh, biologists have told me that what you, you don't see in a woodland, like shrubs, like hobblebush, etc., are often more important than the species you see present. If the deer density is reduced, will the species that have been eaten or removed from the site ever come back? And that's a really uh, great question, Ernest. I can tell you in my own experience, um, I have some uh, a property in north northern Pennsylvania, and um, I've been going there for 40 years, and for the first 30 of those years, I didn't see a single hobble bush. And a little less than 10 years ago, um, the Game Commission started, uh, well, basically reduced the deer population in that area to the extent that there was actually uh, some hobble bush started to grow, uh, to grow back. And it's been there now for um, about maybe five years and it's, you know, some of it's pretty tall and looking pretty good. Um, most of it is growing on the roadsides or on steep hill slopes. And I think maybe what, what may have happened there is that over browsing for a long, long period of time removed hobble bush in most areas or many areas to the point where there's no seed source left. And maybe hobble bush persisted on those steeper slopes longer because they were not as accessible to deer. And so the, uh, the seed source is still there or uh, maybe it was growing, still growing, but would be nipped off when it was very small, and so we just didn't notice it. Um, but so it's possible in some areas where there's a, a very bad legacy effect that you won't be able to get those species back unless you replant them, or it may take a long time until the seeds sources, you know, the seeds are transported there some way. 
Um, but for other species, you might see um, a really quick rebound. Okay, and then Pete, John Howard asks if uh, they can get an email when the website goes live. Is that possible? To yes, absolutely. Great idea. Absolutely. So we'll um, either Christy or I will remember. <laughs> yes, and, and right. we have and we have everybody's email, and uh, and we'll be uh, certain to push that out and let you know about the email as well as the smartphone app. So we'll give instructions on how to get the smartphone app as well. So good idea. Okay. And we didn't, I didn't mention this, we're, we're down to a pretty small audience size, but if there are any cooperating consulting foresters in New York, um, I'm going to be presenting on this topic in Region 5 and Region 6 in early May. So I think it's May 2nd and May 5th. So if you want to, it'll be this presentation that you just saw, but we'll, we'll have another go at it and, and talk some more about it. So. Well, I'm going to call this to a close. Christy, thank you again for another great presentation. And um, every time I see you give this, it gets a little bit better. You tweak it a little here and a little there, and it continues to improve. So um, I appreciate your, your hard work in continuing to uh, bring forward a great product for the audience. And mm, thank, thank the you. audience for spending time with us this evening. Hope you had a... Um, had a, a rewarding experience, and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, using AVID and uh, monitoring plants in your woods. So thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.